Hello and welcome back to another episode of the V8 Supercar Fancast. My name is Kendall, I will be your host once again. And we had a pretty good round at Simmons Plains this time around. Um, we got a few things to discuss, there were some rule changes, um, some regulation changes, new things implemented, things taken away... Um, and for the first time we had someone end the winning streak of the Mustangs. Thank God. <laughs> I was just convinced the Mustangs are going to run away with it this season. They still might. Um, but it does seem like the new rule changes has negatively affected the Mustangs, uh, for the most part. So let's briefly go over some of the rule changes that have been implemented along with a the uh yeah, the qualifying format which if you're new to supercars you might have been surprised by because this is not the qualifying format that they used at uh melbourne or at adelaide and that's because they only use it at shorter circuits um we'll start with qualifying because i'm talking about it right now uh knockout qualifying okay so this is uh knockout qualifying it's quite similar to how it works in formula one if you watch that as well, with a Q1, a Q2, and a Q3, with the uh, fastest times in each, progressing through to the next stage of qualifying, um, it's fairly standard once we actually get to qualifying. So, it's a bit weird, and the reason why they've implemented this is because we have a lot of shorter tracks on the calendar, like Simmons Plains. Um, one lap at Simmons Plains only takes 50 seconds, so... Having 26 cars on track or 25 cars or 24 cars on track means that drivers are constantly fighting for space between the cars on a hot lap and the cars that are warming up or on a cool down lap or something like that. Uh, we had a few near incidences, at, uh, especially Darwin, last uh, not last year, but in 2017. Uh, so they implemented a new format uh, to avoid the crowding of the track at shorter circuits. Um, which is mostly successful. Um, I do have a few issues with it though, because it is a bit, it doesn't really accomplish its job correctly, but, um, you know, I'll get to it. So how it works is that in, there's Q1, there's a Q2 and a Q3, but before we even get to qualifying, there's practice. So, in, in the last practice session, before qualifying, the top 10 fastest time from practice get a free pass into Q2. So, they don't have to do Q1. So, that's the top 10 have automatically qualified for Q2. Then, positions 11th down to last in practice have to do Q1 with the top 5 out of those... Uh, 15 people this this round because uh, normally it'd be 14 but we had a wild card entrance this round so it was 15 so 10 <clears throat> 10 through to 15 drivers sorry um, are then competing for five spots to get into Q2 so there's only five positions in Q1 um, so you may have noticed that qualifying really starts with practice <laughs> which is Ridiculous. Um, and the advantages for getting into the top 10 in, in, uh, in the last practice session are pretty enormous because it means you don't have to spend an extra set of tires trying to get into uh, Q2 v through Q1. Um, it's well worth the teams trying to go for it in practice. It also means they're not beholden to the new park ferme conditions. Um, they can spend more time setting up the car. There are all sorts of reasons why it's more advantageous to go for those hot laps at the end of a practice session than it is to do it in Q1. The problem with this is that all 25 cars are on the track in practice. So, you've got 25 cars who are all going for 10 spots at the end of a practice session. This doesn't really negate the problem that this knockout qualifying was designed to fix. Um... If it was up to me, I would just have everybody do Q1 and make Q1 a longer session. Um, 
make it a 20 minute session or something um and if you really want to split them up into chunks for safety reasons then you can do that that's always going to be hard but maybe you can have them draw lots and split them into two chunks or something because if this was done for safety reasons then it's not addressing them at all because everybody's just going out all 25 cars were going out at practice to set a fast lap essentially it's just qualifying that's all practice is and it makes it's ridiculous because that's not what practice is for practice isn't for going fast and i can kind of see the idea that they would just the top 10 get a free pass um and they didn't really envision uh, anyone going like full just going really at it they just thought that people would practice as normal and the top 10 would just get a free pass into q2 but that's not how motorsport works if they can see an advantage even if it's a small one they're going to exploit it as much as they can which is exactly what they do. So they end up racing around the track in practice, which is worse in a way because you've got cars who are doing all sorts of things in practice. They're not even necessarily trying to go fast. They're just shaking down the car. They're testing new setups. Um, someone might be on a quality lap or someone's doing a race mode. You never know. You never know. So like, it's it's ridiculous trying to have these cars go as fast as possible in, in the last practice session when it basically makes practice another qualifying session so i'm not i don't know i would change it so that every car is in q1 um and if you're really worried about it have them go out in chunks have them go out in lots of split them into two and have them two different qualifying sessions for q1 um and then the best times from each go uh, the top what 10 15 the top 15 combined fastest times from q1 make it into q2 you know, um, if you really want to avoid cars all being on the track at the same time, that's the only real way to do it. Um, yes, it would be more confusing for viewers, but the way that it is, it kind of already is confusing because you've got cars that automatically make it into Q2 and Q1's just kind of like the, eh, whatever, why do I even bother watching it session? Um, so that's, I think that's what I would do. I would, I would at the very least make Q1 longer i think the main reason why they had so many problems in the past is that qualifying sessions are typically quite short for supercars um make it a 20 minute session um and have all cars out on track at once or make it two 10 minute sessions with cars split into two um and they have to draw lots for it or something and that could be really exciting as well because imagine if it rains during one session and it's dry during the other and you've got all these cars who are normally at the front of the grid out of position because track conditions were different for one group versus another. So that could make things really interesting as well. It does add a bit of, a bit of randomness, which I'm not a huge fan of, but if the if the problem is that car there's too many cars on track um, at these smaller circuits and it's dangerous, then that should be addressed. And this is it's not being addressed at the moment. It's just well, it's just this weird workaround, <laughs> which doesn't solve the problem at all. I like knockout qualifying, um, but the format that it's in doesn't make any sense for safety reasons. Um, it's clearly not designed for that, you know? So, that's fine. You know, if they don't care about safety, then that's, you know, whatever. Um, but it only take one big crash in practice for people who are on a hot lap versus a, uh, versus a cool down lap. The exact same problem they wanted to avoid happening in practice for all the rules to be changed again, which I do see happening sometime in the future. It's just some of these tracks are so small, like Simmons Plains is way too short, um, which I think it should be longer. But they're never going to build. They're never going to put more money into <laughs> into Simmons Plains. It's been there for so long. I don't think they're ever going to extend that track. Even though there's all that nice land just after... Um, was it turn four? The hairpin, the big hairpin down that long straight with the right hand kink. There's all that nice land off to the right. Just build, build another section out there. Build a stadium section. It'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, um, I'll get into my grievances with the track later. Um, but basically, yeah, I think the turning practice into a qualifying session is ridiculous. Um, mate, just that's what Q1's for. That's just what Q1 should be for instead of just it being the, ah, uh, oh, it's the people who couldn't make it into, into practice. Couldn't do it in practice. That's, it's the it's the second go. You know, it's the people that you don't really care about 
<laughs> in Q1. And that means I have to burn through more tires and things like that. So um, it is inherently a punishment being forced into Q1. So it is well worth going for it in practice. But, you know, um, we'll see what happens with that. Um, the next time we'll see this type of session is at the next race, Phillip Island. So that track's a lot longer. So it should work a lot better there. Um, we will see. Um, so there, that's how Q1 works. So the 11th through to 24th people who didn't make it in practice, or 25th in this case, uh, who didn't make it into uh, the top 10 in practice, participate in Q1 with the top five positions from that session, moving into Q2 along, along with the top 10 finishes from the previous practice session. Those 15 cars then duke it out in Q2, with the top 10 making it to Q3, and Q3 settling the final order for the grid. Um, knockout qualifying is pretty cool. Um, the drivers like it, the fans like it, so that's good. Um, it does help split the field up at these smaller tracks. I am just worried that it doesn't really avoid the problem entirely. But, you know, it's a cool thing. I'm glad that we're still doing it. O overall, I'm glad that we're still doing it. Uh, I just think it needs a little bit of tweaking to actually accomplish the goal that we're set out to do. But if you don't know, if you didn't know, that's how qualifying worked. That's how it works. So there's two, there's various qualifying sessions with each each one knocking out the uh, last, the slowest plates people until we get a final grid order. It's pretty simple. Like I said, they do it in F1. So if you've been watching F1 at all, um, it's this, it pretty much exactly the same format, except in F1, they don't do the whole practice thing at the start. Um, they just have everybody out on track in Q1. But they don't, they don't, they don't have elimination qualifying because their tracks are so short. So maybe it's a problem with our tracks. Who knows? We have quite a few really short tracks on our calendar, but that's okay. Next, Park Ferme. I said that before, and you might be wondering why I said something that was ostensibly in a different language because it is. It's French. It's French for "Don't touch your car," basically. Um, so again, this is another rule that they do in Formula One. What this basically means is that once, oh, it's a bit different in supercars actually, but. How it works in Formula 1 is that when your car goes out for qualifying, if it goes out, if it leaves the garage during a qualifying session, you can no longer change, make any significant changes to set up. All that stuff is done in practice. Once it leaves for qualifying, the setup that it's in is pretty much the setup that it has to stay in until race, until the end of the race weekend, basically. Um, I like this a lot in theory. Um, what I don't like is the way that Supercars has implemented it. So Supercars is doing this too as a trial, um, which I did enjoy seeing. Um, I think it's a very good idea because it stops teams from overhauling their cars over, uh, over a couple of hours from qualifying spec to race spec. It gives like poorer teams a chance, a better chance at competing because they don't have to spend so much money and time changing the car completely between sessions. Um, which is a good thing. It should narrow up the field a bit and it should also give people who were otherwise quite comfortable in setting up a car for qualifying and then setting it up for race. It should give those people a bit of a shake up because now they have to compromise between a quali car and a race car, which is all good stuff. It's all good stuff. Having more questions about setup in supercars would be good, I think, overall. Um... The thing is, is that in Formula 1, it works because once the car has left the garage for any qualifying session at any point, um, you can no longer work on the car. It's done. In supercars, you can work on the car until the session ends, <laughs> which is so weird, so strange. Um... I don't even think I need to explain why this is such an why this is an odd rule, <laughs> but it basically means in a ten minute session they can go out for one lap and quali spec, come back in, change as much as they want, and then go back out again if they have the time. Um, we didn't really see anyone doing this, um, but like I said before, this is motorsport, and if they can gain an advantage somewhere, they will do it a hundred percent. So if they can find something that they can make a small change to in a, in a small amount of time that makes a big difference. They will do that. And then you could end up with a reality where we have cars going out very early, setting one qualifying run, coming in and then specking their car for the race. Um, 
Yeah, um, it didn't happen during the weekend, possibly because the time is so short, but I would rather that they just have the rule where if the car goes out and hits the track, you can't change it anymore. That's way simpler. It's a lot easier to police. Um, and you don't, we won't, we won't get any silly, like, little people trying to niggle with things um, during qualifying. It just sort of defeats the point <laughs> if they can change it during the session. Um but whatever, um, the system worked for the most part this first time they trialed it, which is good. Um, it's just I do see a lot of room for exploitation there. Um, so uh, yeah, overall, Park Ferme, uh, good idea. Hopefully the implementation doesn't backfire on them. And finally, the last thing I need to go over before we even talk about the race is um, the new center of gravity rule changes for all the cars. Um, so during the Melbourne weekend, um, it was found that the Nissans were actually running a much higher center of center of gravity, um, than the Mustangs or the Holdens, which could have accounted for some of the difference in, um, buying, uh, what's the word performance. There we go. <laughs> some of the difference in performance, um, between, the Nissans and the Mustangs and the Holdens because the Nissans haven't been so hot this year. Um, and uh, so as a result, um, the ballast, which is used to uh, make sure that all the cars weigh the same, it's just a bunch of lead weights, has been moved from the floor of the Holden and the Mustang up into the roof in order to make the center of gravity in the cars the same. Um, if you're not sure why that matters, basically all it means is that the center of gravity affects how the car handles. Um, it affects its cornering ability and its corner speed. Um, and it basically, yeah, it just affects how well it can corner. So putting it in the floor and making the center of gravity lower means that the car is more stable from a corner, whereas putting it higher means that it's less stable around a corner. Um, and both the Mustang and the Holden have quite a lot of ballast weight in them because they are much lighter cars overall than the minimum weight requirement which is about 1400 kilos um so they have quite a lot of ballast in them uh supposedly i'm not sure how much i couldn't find any information on exactly how much ballast is in these cars but so uh supposedly it is much more than the nissan's which would explain why the nissan center of gravity is a lot higher on average um because nobody chooses to put their ballast in the roof because that's silly. <laughs> You'd put your ballast as low as possible to get the center of gravity low. Um, so those have been moved to the roof. And this is the first races that we get to see with the new um, center of gravity changes, which did seem to make a difference for the Mustangs. Um, so we will go into the results of the races and see how we do. I think, um, just trying to think if I had anything else to say. I don't think so. Um, so let's talk about qualifying. Um, so I'm going to go through this in the order that they were knocked out in because that's just more dramatic that way. Um, so in Q1, Scott Pye was the first to be knocked out. Um, continuing the, his pretty poor run this year. Uh, James Courtney has really been showing him up in these first few uh, rounds. Um, whereas last year, they were often very even. Um, so, hopefully he picks his game up. Uh, Richie Stanaway, Rick Kelly, as you can see, the Nissan's not really improving <laughs> with it, despite the field being ostensibly leveled. Um, James Golding, once again, not very far off Richie Stanaway. Um, Jack LeBrock, Macaulay Jones, wildcard entrant for BJR, Jack Smith, um, who has just the longest hair. I wasn't expecting it. I saw him take his helmet off, and I was like, whoa! <laughs> it's, he looks like he belongs in a L'Oreal commercial. Um, and Smoda De Silvestro on 23rd, Jerry Jake... Jerry? <laughs> Gary Jacobson in 24th, and Andre Heimgartner in 25th, who didn't even set a lap because his car... Had issues. I don't remember what happened. Um, I think he just had technical issues and his car wouldn't go. Um, so he didn't set a lap. Very frustrating for him. Um, very frustrating weekend for him overall. Um, I feel really bad for him. Um, I think he's definitely a very good driver. So it's a shame to see him stuck down there like that. Um, in Q2, 
Chaz Mostert knocked out into 11th spot. Um, he wasn't happy at all, um, again, during both days. Um, the Tickford car's really struggling for setup, either, either with the ballast um, or the new park Ferme conditions really really uh, tripping them up, I think, um, because uh, they did, Chaz men- mentioned during the weekend that their car was struggling for one lap pace. So their race pace seemed fine, um, but yes, the one lap pace did seem off, and that's probably the park Ferme uh, to blame for that one. Um, but that's the rules. There's the new rules now, so um, we'll see how Tickford bounces back from that. I do worry about Tickford. Their, their setup doesn't seem to be... Their ability to set a car up properly doesn't seem to be the greatest compared to the other top teams. Um, but, you know, who knows? There only really seems to be two teams that knock it out every week. So, um, who knows what's going on? Uh, Nick Perka in 12th, Will Davison in 13th, Todd Hazelwood, good job from him in 14th, and Jamie Winkup also out in Q2, not setting a lap. Um, I think think he locked the brakes and spun into the sand trap from memory um yes he did so he was coming down to turn four the big head the big banked hairpin locks the brakes dips a wheel onto the grass he tries to spin it around to keep it going and he just beaches himself which caused a red flag and obviously a red flag means that you can't participate in qualifying any longer um so he was out of that session into 15th spots not a great weekend for jamie either especially since he entered the championship entered the championship Entered this weekend in second by about 30 points down. And uh, as we will see, he, that will uh, very quickly erode. Um, as for Q1, though, um, Cameron Waters in 10th, Lee Holdsworth in 9th. I think that's his best qualifying position, actually, this year. So not a bad job from him. Anton Di Pasquale in 8th, Tim Slade in 7th, James Courtney in 6th. He did a really good job to be up, up there as high as he was. Um, David Reynolds in fifth, Fabian Coulthard in fourth, Shane Van Gisbergen in third, Scott McLaughlin in second, and Mark Winterbottom with his first pole position for his new Team 18 team. (laughs) Um, Excellent job from him. They had a great weekend overall, um, but excellent job from him to put that on pole. Um, The gap from him to Mark Winterbottom sorry, to Scott McLaughlin was 0.004 of a second with Mark Winterbottom putting in a 50.6920 and Scott McLaughlin putting in a 50.6960. That's how close their laps were. It was insane how close they were. Um, And then even Shane was only, uh, he was a thousandth back from that again. So... The top three, extremely close. Um, But overall, the disparity between first and last isn't even that huge. Um, Eight tenths back to the last car, um, which you can't be too too disappointed about in terms of qualifying, um, but it always seems like it's just the same people at the top, um, which is fine. Scott McLaughlin didn't come in didn't come in pole position, which uh, Mark Winterbottom finally breaking that streak as well. Um, with the only other person to out-qualify Scotty uh, up to this point was Fabian. Um, and uh, yeah, Mark Winterbottom can add to that list. Very impressive job. Very impressive job from a team that was nowhere last year. Absolutely nowhere. So great job from him. Great job from them. Now we're getting to the race. So the race starts... Winterbottom gets an awful start and McLaughlin gets into the lead. Um, And Fabian also gets past him. Shane got a bad start as well. Um, And we ended up with a... Very quickly ended up with a race with another very familiar Scott McLaughlin in first place who commanded and controlled the race. Who came home and took it in the end with a case of the flu as well while he was racing. So... Um, very impressive that he managed to control the race the way it did, as well as be sick. That's not easy. <laughs> as someone who has been sick before, I can tell you that that sucks. Um, so, um, overall, it was an alright race. Um, 50 laps at Simmons Plains takes like 40 minutes, so it wasn't very long. Um, but it was interesting enough. 
we did get some action um no huge incidents though it was quite a safe race and that's mainly because the layout of the track is so restrictive um i know this is where we had that huge pile up in i think it was 2015 or 2016 we had the huge pile up just on the way up to turn four um but there's not really a lot that can actually happen here um there's only two corners that you can sort of pass at um there's only really three corners that you can physically pass at and there's only really two that it ever really happens at and even then one of them the banked hairpin is not really a passing spot because it is banked it is faster to go around the outside which is what you would have seen if you're watching it so if you're wondering why they're all going around the outside there it's banked so keeping up the rolling speed especially with that big straight is more important than taking the inside line it's faster to go around the outside there so any car that did try to go up the inside couldn't put the power down fast enough to get a good run up the straight to stay alongside them. So this means that the only really good overtaking spot is at the end of that straight, um, which we did see a lot of passes at, but it wasn't really possible unless you had a very, if, unless you had a significantly faster car in terms of pace. And we saw this heaps of times over the weekend where two cars would be right on top of each other, but none of them was significantly faster than the other so they just couldn't get around them um i think cameron waters got stuck behind um de pasquale in this race from pretty much halfway through till the end just because his car was clearly faster but if you make your car wide enough and the disparity in pace isn't that big it's pretty much impossible for anyone to get past you this track is not easy to overtake out even with these cars where they can sort of push their way past it's really not possible here um that's why I was saying that it'd be nice to have a bit of an extension just for, for some more overtaking opportunities. A sharp right-hander would be nice. Um, you know, along that along that straight and then we could just go into a little bit of a stadium section out near the sheep. The sheep can watch and then you can come back down to the, the start-finish straight. Um, I think the track overall is a little short and it's only got one good overtaking spot and even that's not even very good. So, um, I think it's a fun track. I do like it. It's historic for sure. But um, aside from that, really sharp, like it's got a really sharp hairpin at the end of a long straight that the drivers can't even take advantage of because it's banked. Um, if that If that hairpin at turn four wasn't banked and drivers could make a pass up the inside... I don't think I'd be complaining about this track nearly as much. Um, but because it is banked, it effectively completely removes one of the turns for overtaking, um, which sucks. It really does. So um, hopefully we see some kind of, I don't know, something. <laughs> something different there. But let's go over the results. Why don't we? Um, Jamie Winkup. In 25th position. Um, he had an awful race. <laughs> He's, um, he only completed 48 laps. He was two laps down. Um, um, so in case you didn't see the race for whatever reason or you missed it. Um, Wing Cup coming back through the field. Uh, had some early lap contact with Chaz Mostert, I believe it was. Um, which gave him a puncture and sent him off the track. Uh, he went into the pits, got it fixed up, but he came out two laps down and that's where he stayed. Just net the 30 points that that's worth. <clears throat> oh, Sorry. Very sorry. Um, so he had an awful Saturday. He really did. Um... Gary Jacobson in 24th. Jack Smith in 23rd for his first race. Um, Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Simona Di Silvestro, the uh, first of the last of the people who was still on the lead lap. Uh, Macaulay Jones. Will Davison. Not a great race for him either. Um, I don't believe anything in particular went wrong from him. I think he just uh, didn't have a great race. Um, Andre Heimgartner in 18th. He made a pretty good recovery, up seven spots. Uh, Rick Kelly in 17th, Richie Stanaway and James Gorney once again side by side in 16th and 15th. Todd Hazelwood who didn't move a muscle from 14th spot. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in 13th, Scott Pye in 12th. He made another alright recovery to make it up to 12th. Um, the 
um, nearly called them Boost Mobile Cars, and not anymore. Um, Walken Show Andretti, that's them. The uh, Walken Show Andretti cars have seemed to be pretty good this season at uh, making out spots during the race. Um, so maybe their race pace is much better than their qualifying pace suggests. Um, we will see. Uh, Cameron Waters in 11th, Chaz Moster in 10th, Anton Bit Di Pasquale in 9th, Nick Perka in 8th, Tim Slade in 7th. Again, not moving from his qualifying position at all. Um, he was solid. Didn't see him at all during the race, but he was solid. Uh, David Reynolds in 6th, James Courtney in 5th, Mark Winterbottom in 4th. Just, just missing out on a podium because Shane Van Gisbergen came on a late race charge and took it from him on the penultimate lap for the second last lap. Um, so Shane came third, Fabian came second, and Scott McLaughlin leading home a 1-2 for DJR Penske. Um, yeah, it was a bit gutted for Winterbottom, um, but... I would want their first podium, their first real victory to be won. Um, You know, actually properly fought for and not just because Shane doesn't go for it. Um, Shane clearly had the speed. It was sort of going to happen. And it wasn't helped along by uh, the wildcard Jack Smith. Um, So one of the reasons why Winterbottom was overtaken by... Shane is because he caught up with the lapped traffic of Jack Smith and he didn't really get out of the way fast enough. Um, so Scotty complained as well, um, but he had no one behind him, so it didn't really matter. Winterbottom was fighting for uh, third position with Shane right behind him and he was held up by Jack for one corner, um, but it was enough. Um, it put him down, would have put him down by about a second or so. Um, which was enough for Shane to be right on top of him by um, the midway through the last lap, and then he overtook him um, without having without Winterbottom being able to put up much of a fight. Um, and I mean, <laughs> um, so watching watching the race, I thought he was being a bit strange because he was not like he was fighting. If he was, he wasn't fighting anybody on track, Jack Smith. Um, he was just on his own being lapped and he was just kind of sitting on the racing line down, down the straights. He was just kind of sitting there. <laughs> he wasn't moving over for them at all. Um, and, uh, so I've got some quotes from him. Um, so Smith says, um, I let them through. I had McLaughlin behind me. I knew he was there. I put the indicator on a couple of times and said, the gap's there, go for it. And I was waiting for him to pass me and he didn't a couple of times. I was fully aware that everyone was there. Winterbottom had passed me as soon as he got to me, so I don't really see what the problem is. I let them through as well as I thought I could. I don't really see how I could have lost him a trophy. I didn't really want to get on the brakes and move offline. I felt like I had my own race to do in a way. I didn't think there was an issue. So <laughs> he didn't want to move offline, which is kind of the problem. Um, if you're a lapped car going down a straight, and especially at Simmons Plains where there isn't really any overtaking opportunities like smooth ones, the best thing you can do if there's no one around you that can overtake you is to just move off the line and roll off the throttle a bit. Um, you don't have to jump on the brakes, but just come offline roll off the throttle and let the people pass, especially if they're in a fight. Um, he did, he was in front of Inglogan for a while. Um, and it was a little silly that he didn't just roll off the throttle again, down the straight and let him through. Uh, especially when it's the leader. Um, but it's even worse when there's your lap traffic and someone's having a fight for position and you're holding that up. Even if you are just on the racing line down the straight, it's best just to get out of the way, roll off the front a little bit, let them pass, and then go back to your race. Because there was no one around him. Like I said, it's not like he would have lost track position doing this. He wasn't risking anything. He was just kind of sitting there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, he really shouldn't be doing stuff like that, especially as a wild card. He's not even a championship contender. It doesn't even matter if he gets overtaken for position. He's not even in this full time. Um, he really should just be, like I said, rolling off the throttle, moving well out of the way, letting people through, and then going back to his race because he's there 
He's there to get a feel for how racing and supercars works. He's not there to get championship points. And even if he was there to get championship points, there wasn't anyone around him. He wouldn't have lost any track position by rolling off the throttle down the straight. You know, I'm making shrugging motions. Um, (laughs) Because this is not a video podcast. Um, Yeah, no, I just, I don't agree with that. At all, Mr. Smith. Um... Yeah, it's yeah. When well, yeah, when you're a wild card and you're that far down the field and there's no one around you, just get out of the way. Just get out of the way. There's it's no no reason to be in the way. Just just move out of the way, you know? Play it safe. Um but that was race 7, a uh, shorter race, wasn't very long. Uh didn't provide us with much frills and spills, just a late charge from Gizzy to get back into the podium. Um but otherwise a very dominating performance from the um, DJR Penske cars with Fabian Coulthard finally getting into a good position on his own sort of account. He made some good overtakes to get there. So good on him. He looked pretty good this weekend, but not good enough as we'll see in the next set of results. So the Sunday race, the big one, we'll go with qualifying first, which was <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> so... Very early in qualifying, uh, Macaulay Jones has a uh, unforced error at turn four, the hairpin. The impact, apex of the corner, I assume, what he tries to do is get the power down too early and, and he spins it around. Um, Heimgardner, who's not far behind him, runs into him. And then uh, Jacobson, who seems to be way too close behind Heimgardner, runs straight into the back of him. Um, which, there was an onboard of, of uh, Heimgardner when this happened and he just slams the steering wheel and swears and I can't blame him because that would be so frustrating um there wasn't anything he could have done to avoid it um uh Jones spinning the way that he did um but uh Jacobson probably could have been a little bit further behind and he probably could have driven under him um this caused a huge pile up because there was three cars at the hairpin in a row um will davison tried to go around the outside and flick it which anton was there and they sort of ran into each other a little bit and then um uh, i think percat also got there and he kind of got stuck and everyone just kind of sat there for a bit and, <laughs> and tried to figure out what to do um that was awkward um yeah macaulay jones was out with a uh, quite a bit of damage to the uh front left of his car because that's the part that Heimgartner hit. Heimgartner was able to race. He didn't have too many problems. Um, I think he was even able to go out into qualifying and do some laps. Yeah, he did. I'm just looking at the uh, the results. So he wasn't too badly damaged, um, despite being ran into on both sides. Um, but um, yeah, that's just uh, that was very unfortunate for him. Um, I can't really say that I feel too bad for for Macaulay Jones. That was an extremely, extremely unforced error. He just tried to put... It looks to me like he's trying to put the power down way too early around the bank turn, and he just spins. That's it. Um, You know, he's had... He's had some bad luck this season. He hasn't had a great start to the season, but a lot of it's been his fault. Um... You know, it's the sort of thing that it's simple things like that that you just can't do in qualifying. You just gotta, you just can't do it. You know, like that's that's qualifying over basically, especially if you spin on a racing line like that. Um, yeah, just you know, especially at a bank turn, like just come off the, just don't don't be so aggressive, man. Just you know, just chill out. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, it's all well and good for me to say, but um. Yeah, no, I haven't been super impressed with Macaulay Jones's effort so far this season. Um, I wasn't super impressed with him as a wildcard driver either, um, especially since his two teammates who should be in the same cars as him um, are running way better than he is. Last season, um, the BJR cars weren't great. They were sort of all over the place. Um, this season, Nick Perkett and Tim Slade are doing pretty well overall, especially Tim Slade. Um, he's doing well in the championship. I think he's in the top, he's definitely in the top 10. Um, so yeah, like the fact that, um, 
Macaulay Jones is so far back all the time is a bit worrying to me. Um, this happened to Tim Blanchard as well when he was in the sport. Um, I don't really know if there's something different with that car. Um, it doesn't... Yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't understand um, why it's, if that car's just got a problem or if everyone who drives it's just not very good or what. But I, I think it's definitely probably too early to judge his overall speed, but I haven't been super impressed with him so far, basically. Um, so he didn't set time in qualifying, so he started in 25th position and last. Uh, Will Davison in 24th, 1.8 seconds down from the top time. Uh, he never set a, a, uh, a fast time, basically. he uh, The one hot lap he did get to go on, he scuffed, uh, locked the brakes and went off the track at the last corner, which is silly, and he said that himself. Um, so that sucks for him. Um, but, you know, mistakes happen. He needs to consolidate and move on, which is a shame because Will Davison was so was up there in the championship. He still is, but, like, I wanted to see him. I wanted to see him up there, you know? I wanted to see Will Davison fight for the championship again. That would have been awesome. Um, hopefully, Tickford can come back next round and we can get some proper fighting from all the boys at Tickford, not just Davison, but Mostert, Waters, um, and Holdsworth, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you feel so inclined. Um... Simona in 23rd, Gary Jacobson in 22nd. They always seem to be qualifying there or thereabouts in the same spot. Um, Jack Smith in 21st, Jack LeBrock, once again, both together the Jacks, uh, in 20th. James Golding in 19th, Andre Heimgartner in 18th, Todd Hazelwood in 17th, and Nick Perkat rounding out the Q1 uh, eliminations. Uh, Nick Perkat not happy with his uh, performance uh, or the car, and I can't blame him. He's a good driver, Percat, um, and I really do think it's just the BJR cars that are letting them down, to be honest. I think if I was him, I'd be trying to go negotiate a way out of that team, because, yeah, but, you know. It'd, it'd be nice to see Nick Percat and Tim Slade doing a bit better, because I do think they're both pretty quality drivers. Um, I don't think we've seen the best from either of them at all. So hopefully we do get to see that at some point. In the future. Um, as for Q2, Scott Pye, he made it into Q2 this time, but he was immediately eliminated <laughs> in the 15th spot. Um, Lee Holdsworth in 14th. Jamie Winkup eliminated in Q2. Only he made it to 13th position. Um, no, nothing actually happened to him this time. I have no idea why he didn't make it through Q2. Um, he really should be, especially considering where his teammate got to. Um, so... I don't know. Um, I was going to say I haven't been happy with Winkup's performance, but he's been the most consistent Red Bull driver this season. So who knows? It's too early to tell. Um, we'll have to wait a couple more rounds before I start really judging people on their performance this season. But um, Winkup seems to have been all over the place this year. Let's just say that. It might be the new Park Ferme rules that have really gotten him. That have really gotten him. A lot of things have changed for this round. So we can't judge people too heavily um, for mistakes and things like that. Um, for what seems like odd qualifying positions, so we'll see. We'll see how things pan out. Um, Tim Slade in 12th, Rick Kelly in 11th, not a bad recovery from the previous day. Um, and that rounds out the Q2 elimination. So Q1, we've got Chaz Mostert in 10th, um, who was 1.2 seconds down from the fastest time, which is a pretty, pretty big gap. Um, this is because during his... Well, I don't actually know why uh, he's so far down, but he was making another hot lap towards the end of the session, and he comes across quite a lot of traffic coming up to turn four, and one of those pieces of traffic is Shane Van Gisbergen on what is kind of his line. Um, uh, Chaz has to roll out of the brake to turn and avoid him without locking up. He then has then, then doesn't have enough space to put the brakes on and slow it up before um the turn he goes spearing off in the gravel trap he didn't hit the fence thankfully he nearly could have um he got quite close um he wasn't very happy about it afterwards saying that shame was on his line um that it was dangerous driving um i've watched the clip a few times and i can see where he's coming from shane is on his line 
Um, but the thing is, is that Chaz is on the left-hand side of the track, so he's not on the racing line to begin with. The reason why he's down there is because he's dodging cars that were on the right side of the track, so he's already off the racing line, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to, in the braking zone, point the car across the track so it's going in a straight line and drift towards the right, so he's back on the racing line by the time he has to turn it into the corner. Um, The problem with that is that Shane's in the way, so Shane's in the middle of the track. He's not really... He's not on the far left. Um, he's not on the far left. He's in the middle. But there is there is definitely a car width's worth of room um, to the right. It's not. He's not blocking that space at all. So the racing line, he is not on the racing line. But he is in the way of Chaz Mostert because Chaz is coming down from the far left side up onto the right side while he's braking. Um... So in the end, there was no penalty given, and I think I agree with this one, um, just because Shane didn't know he was coming. Um, Chaz was making a dash for a bunch of traffic, um, and he only comes across Shane in the in the braking zone. Um, Shane did leave space on the racing line. It's not like there's no space there. Um, anyone who tells you that there's no space on that racing line is is <laughs> they're just they're being ridic- they're being ridiculous because there is enough space there for a car 100 percent. if there is a car coming down that the normal racing line uh there wouldn't have been a problem there 100 percent wouldn't have been a problem uh the reason why there is a problem is because Chaz is offline in the first place um yeah i think if there was if there was an accident if this was during a race i think racing incident would be the way to chalk it up and i think that's pretty much what's happened um shane could have been further to the left Chaz could have been on the racing line you know um, these things happen. Um, if anything, the, the, the um, reason Chaz should, is down on the left-hand side of the track, the far left-hand side of the track, should be um, analysed a little bit further because he shouldn't be there at all. Like, that's not the racing line. He should be on the racing line. Um, and if he was down there avoiding traffic, then why is the traffic on the racing line? Um, yeah, you know, um, things like these happen. Um, I really don't think Shane was being dangerous at all. I think he was pretty reasonable in where he put the car. Um, he could have been further to the left, 100%, but also qualifying had ended, and 90% of the cars were going slow as well. So had it been during regular qualifying conditions, um, uh, maybe Chaz would be a little bit more justified, um, but um, qualifying session had had ended and Chaz was making a very last ditch flying lap um and uh, all these factors combined I really don't think a penalty is sort of warranted for um dangerous driving in that situation um just because there are so many factors that lead up to this being basically an unfortunate incident um I don't really think either of the drivers are particularly at fault. I think Chaz is right to be upset. <laughs> 100%. I'd be upset too. Um, but I also don't think that any punishment is really due for that. Um, I sort of agree with the final decision on that one. I don't really think that there was anything there that needed to be addressed in particular. I think it was just mainly just an unfortunate incident. Um uh, sucks for Chaz though very unfortunate for him but not really sure why he couldn't put in a faster lap before that though because a uh, second 1.2 seconds down is, is a lot um, and it's not like that was the first lap he did so who knows <laughs> who knows um, but anyway um, Chaz in 10th James Courtney in 9th Cameron Waters in 8th uh, Richie Stanaway in 7th excellent qualifying from him excellent qualifying um Anthony Pasquale in six he's been pretty pretty good in qualifying these days uh, which is nice to see Scott McLaughlin in fifth spot we haven't seen Scotty out of position at all this season um not that fifth is that far out of position but it's something it's something <laughs> so I was excited to see what is normally a uh bang on pole position every single time go to someone completely different, which was nice. Um, and not only that, but Scotty's not even in the top three. He's down in fifth. 
Um, I was like, yes, we're on for a good race today. <laughs> we won't just have a DJR car running away with it for once. Um, so, which seems a bit silly considering last year it was mainly triple eight cars running away with it, but you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, ideally I'd like to have every team up there fighting all the time. Can we get those Erebus cars up there? Can we get those Tickford cars up there? I was so happy when Chaz won that race at Melbourne. Um, just for what it meant for the championship, but now Tickford's back down again. Like, come on guys, can you just, can we get someone up there consistently that isn't T8 or DJR, please? It's, <laughs> I want to have, have more people to fight it out. It's only Scotty and Shane at the moment. Um, Mark Winterbottom in fourth, another great qualifying session from him. David Reynolds in third, Fabian Coulthard in second, and Shane Van Gisbergen in first place. The first pole position of the year for him. Um, good job from him. Good job from Fabian, it's ultra consistent. Uh, good job for David Reynolds as well, because that was his best qualifying session of, the session of the season as well. The Erebus car started off pretty dire this year, and they seem to have really dragged it back, which is good. Um, I'm happy to see that, because uh, Davey really does deserve to be up there. He's a great driver. Um, and Winterbottom as well. Again, another great driver that deserves to be up there, and he's doing better than Tickford now. So maybe he made the right decision after all. Um, we'll see come the end of the season. Um but interesting qualifying session followed by a, a fairly standard race. Um, nothing super exciting happened, but then again, it was a good race. There was action happening up and down the field all the time. Um, this race is super duper chaotic just because of how short it is. Um, people come out of the pits, they come in a lap down. It's a whole thing. Like <laughs> it's, the, the track is so short that taking a pit stop from the midfield puts you a lap down. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's just a whole mess really, to keep track of during the race. Um, but how it ended up. Um, Gary Jacobson, not classified. I believe he had some kind of electrical issue. Um, so he didn't make it, unfortunate for him. Jack Smith in 24th. Anton Di Pasquale in 23rd. Anton, um, don't actually know what happened to Jack Smith. He must have had some kind of problem. But Anton's uh, gear stick actually uh, came off his came off his car <laughs> he read it and said i have the gear stick in my hand um and it's just it's missing the nut that um that keeps it into the more well, keeps it attached <laughs> so it's just got this loose gear stick and you can't change gears so he was stuck in fourth gear had this whole mess where he's like i'm gonna come in teams like stay out get points so he just sort of trundles around in fourth gear for a while um i do kind of wish that if they'd made so the rule is that if you make 75 percent race distance you get points if you finish. You have to finish the race. You can't come in after 75% race distance. And I really wish you could because it would stop things like this happening where you've just got a, one car trundling around for no reason and just kind of being a nuisance and in the way. Um, would have been so much better if he hit 75% and just pitted because he could have just pitted and ended the race and then he's got points, boom. Um, and would have gotten a, a very slow car off the field. I think that's something that should be looked into because... It's silly that they have to sort of trundle around just incredibly slowly for ages um, just to get points. But unfortunate for him, he was in for a top 10 finish, which would have been good for him. Uh, Jack LeBrock in 22nd, Simona Di Silvestro in 21st, Macaulay Jones in 20th, Richie Stanaway down 12 spots into 19th. Um, he had an awful second pit stop. I uh, believe they cross-threaded the wheel nut, uh, which put him all the way down into 19th super shame for him because he was doing so well. He was doing really well. He's on for a top 10 finish. He was. Um, so I was unhappy to see that because I, I just, I think Stanaway's got, I think Stanaway is good. He just needs to clean his act up a bit and he's, and he just needs to put that one result together. Um, and it just sort of hasn't happened for him. It's either been his fault or his team's fault or some controversy has happened or whatever. Um, I think he's got some talent in him that is just, needs to be found um but he needs to keep his head down and he needs to do it um because he's been a bit of a controversial figure at times as well as his team sort of cocking things up occasionally uh todd hazelwood in 18th andre Homegardner, mr consistency in 17th james golding in 16th rick kelly in 15th will davison up 10 spots to 14th not a bad drive from him uh james courtney in 13th tim slade once again not moving an inch in 12th Cameron Waters in 11th. Chaz Mostert also not moving in, in 10th. Lee Holdsworth up five spots to ninth. Not bad from him. We don't normally see him moving around the field 
in a positive direction. So good job from him. Scott Pye up seven spots to eighth, and Nick Perkut up nine spots to seventh. Good job from both of them. Um, excellent drive from Nick Perkut and Scott Pye. Really, really excellent. Uh, Mark Winterbottom down uh, two spots to six. Jamie Winkup up eight to fifth. He had an excellent recovery as well on a tracks where it's quite hard to overtake. Drives from Will Davison, Lee Holdsworth, Scott Pye, Nick Perkat, and Jamie Winkup are great to see. Uh, granted, most of it is vaulting in the pit stops, but overtakes and overtake, you know. Uh, Scott McLaughlin in fourth. David Reynolds grabbing a podium in third. Fabian Coulthard in second. And Shane Van Gisbergen with a well-deserved win in first. He really did control the race quite effectively. Um, and yeah, great race um, overall. Um, like I said, there wasn't any huge incidents or anything like that, but we did get to see some interesting fighting going on around the field. Um, around the field. Let me just talk properly first. Um, some nice side-by-side action from uh Shane and da- and uh, Shane and David Shane and Coulthard um and then uh Coulthard and Reynolds also had quite a quite an interesting fight um Wing Cup and Winterbottom came out right on top of each other and they were sort of fighting it out all the way until the end um so we we did have some good some good look at things uh going on around the field so that was good to see um overall a satisfying race. Um, I do wish that there was a track alteration that could be made to Simmons' planes. I do think it's too short. Um, but that's the nature of things. Um, that's just how we roll in supercars. We play it by the seat of our pants. So, Simmons' planes down. Now that it's been a couple of rounds, and uh, I haven't discussed the championship points yet, but let's look at it now. Let's look at it now. Um, so, in first place, Scott McLaughlin with 770 points. He no longer has that nice, even, um, divisible by 100, uh, divisible by 50 point number, which is, <laughs> he had that for a long time, so, um, it's still divisible by zero, uh, by zero? It's still divisible by, uh, five and ten, which is interesting. Um, in first place, Fabian Coulthard in second now. Um, who is the only driver within one race victory of Scotty. He's 124 points back, followed by Jamie Winkup in third, who's 160 points back, and now the point totals get a lot closer together. Um, So Jamie is more than one race win away from eclipsing Scotty. Um, Remember, a race win is 150 points, so Jamie is 160 points back. That means he's at least two races away from eclipsing Scotty, should Scotty not finish a race. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen, 166 points down. David Reynolds in fifth, 171 points. Chaz Mostert in sixth, in, with 177 points down. And then a bit of a gap back to Mark Winterbottom in seventh, who is 214 points down. And one point behind him is Tim Slade. Uh, Nick Perkat in ninth. Will Davison in tenth. James Courtney in eleventh. Uh, Cameron Waters in twelfth, who his points really doesn't reflect how well his season uh, how well his drives have been this season. He's had a bit of bad luck, to be honest. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in 13th. Anton Di Pasquale in 14th. Andre Heimgarten is actually the first of the Nissans in 15th. Uh, Scott Pye in 16th. Todd Hazelwood in 17th. James Golding in 18th. Rick Kelly in 19th. Simona in 20th. Richie Dunaway in 21st. Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Gary Jacobson in 23rd. Macaulay Jones in 24th. And wildcard Jack Smith in 25th position. As for team points, as you can imagine from the tallies I've been running, I've been rattling off. DJR is running away with it a little bit in first place, followed by Red Bull Holden Racing team. Um, uh, BJR is actually in third. Good on them with the first of the Tickford teams, the uh, Lee Holdsworth and Chaz Mostert combination in fourth. Uh, Cameron Waters in fifth. I believe that's I think that's Cameron Waters and Will Davison from memory. It just says Cameron Waters on the uh, website, but uh, I believe that's both of them. Um, Erebus in six, not super great from them. They did have a bit of a slow start this season, um, so hopefully they can pick that up a bit now that Anton's actually fighting for good points this year as well. Hopefully I can we can see them up a bit further. Um, uh, Walkinshaw and Dreddy. 
in seventh. Um, the uh, Kelly Racing cars of Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgartner in eighth. Uh, Gary Rogers in ninth. Mark Winterbottom all in his lonesome, all by himself in tenth, doing better than uh, Simona and Gary Jacobson combined. Um, Todd Hazelwood in twelfth. Um, Jack LeBrock in thirteenth. And Macaulay Jones all in his lonesome in 14th position. So those are your championship points. The next race. Where is the next race? Well, it's a Phillip Island classic track. Um, and it's only a week away. Only a week away. It's so exciting. <laughs> it's got a, our first back-to-back is coming up at Phillip Island this week. The 12th to the 14th of April. Um, the race 9 is on Saturday and race 10 is on Sunday. Once again, with knockout qualifying, which I don't think is necessary because this track is a bit longer, but whatever. Um, it's kind of cool to see. Um, yeah. That's all I've got for this week's episode of the V8 Supercars fancast thank you for listening i'll see hopefully you get to watch philip island because it should be an exciting race it always is it's a good track um make sure you watch philip Island. make sure you look out for the next episode which will be going up hopefully on the monday or the tuesday after philip island until next time though uh i'll see you later <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to say or add or ask or whatever, don't forget to leave a comment behind, behind, below. Um, I'll see it there, obviously. Um, so if you have a question for me, if you want to tell me that I'm wrong um, uh, about anything and call me an idiot, then feel free to do so. It's cathartic, so go for it. Um, until then, um, until I hear from you or until you hear from me, my name has been Kendall of Bearded Kendall. I will see you on the next Viet Supercars fancast. Goodbye.